This was the moment when the world suddenly woke up to what's been happening in Ecuador over the past few years. On the 9th of January in the coastal city of Guayaquil, masked gunmen forced their way into TC Television's studio whilst it was broadcasting live. You see staff members being rounded up, forced to sit on the floor. The gunmen are armed with shotguns, rifles, pistols and some kind of grenade and other explosives. Occasionally, you'd see one of them push a staff member to the floor. A woman is heard pleading to them, don't shoot, please don't shoot. And another staff member sent a message via WhatsApp saying that they came to kill us. One of the journalists is seen talking. He's being told to give the police a message not to enter the premises. At the same time, one of the gang members to his side is pointing a shotgun at his neck. Another puts what looks like dynamite in his suit pocket. The gang members are seen waving weapons around, declaring that they have bombs, occasionally you hear gunfire. They also appear to realise that they're currently beaming live into the homes of people around the country. And so they make hand signals and gestures. And it's strange because it reminds me of the behaviour of children who suddenly realise that there is a TV camera and they start waving in the background. And that's just it. They're all young. Two were minors. The oldest, 25. Eventually, after around 15 minutes, the live feed is cut. Now, remarkably, no one was killed during this chaos, although two employees at the TV studio suffered significant injuries. One was shot in the leg and the other suffered a broken arm. 13 of the gunmen were arrested after police stormed the building. They've been charged with terrorism. So the question is why? Welcome to Deep Dive from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. And this is What is Going On in Ecuador. Let's rewind back to December 2020 in the city of Manta on the Pacific coast. A man called Jorge Luis Zambrano sat with his wife and daughter in a food court of the Mall del Pacifico shopping centre. As always, he was with his security team of three. But a gunman approached and shot him multiple times and he died at the scene. Jorge Luis Zambrano went by another name, an alias, Rasquinha the leader of a powerful Ecuadorian gang called Los Joneros, who are linked to the Mexican Sinaloa cartel. He led them for almost a decade, although much of that time during his incarceration. He'd only been released from prison six months earlier. So who are Los Joneros? So Los Joneros were the main criminal group operating in Ecuador, and that group was mainly a logistical provider. And it literally take care of transport, storage, and then shipment in the local scenario. This is Felipe Botero Escobar, head of Andean programs at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Some of the biggest leaders from Los Choneros were captured and were put in the jails. And in 2018, one of the main leaders was killed inside the jail. And this started a huge fight among them. And that was the beginning of the division of Los Choneros in different organized crime groups. And this allowed other local, like ground-based criminal groups to start rising their profile and getting much more visibility in the Ecuadorian context as Los Choneros was more concerned in solving their on internal dispute. And right now, they're probably not anymore the biggest or the main player, but just one of the biggest with other ones that have resulted of their crisis. Insight Crime have some detailed background on this instability, but let me try and distill it. So for years, Los Choneros had battled against Los Cubanos and Los Lagatos for control of the prisons and the illicit markets on the street until the untimely death of two prominent gang figures. One was decapitated in prison, and the other died of COVID. But the murder of Rasquinha months after his release caused its own power vacuum at the top of Los Choneros. Eventually, José Adolfo Marcias Villimar, known as Fito, emerged as the new leader of Los Choneros. And let me be indulgent for a moment and tell you about this guy. If you followed any of the stories coming out of Ecuador, you will probably have seen a picture of Fito, as he's quite distinctive. 
He's a stocky man with wide shoulders and a large dark beard and long dark wiry hair. Now, according to the authorities, inside the prison he controlled La Regionale. Fito threw parties, cockerel fighting matches, he had a tiled bathroom and other home comforts. But as we know, prisons are violent, so he had access to weapons, including guns. Finally, Fito had a painting of himself in robes because apparently he studied and gained a diploma in criminal law whilst in prison. We even got a glimpse of him in a music video, a narco corrido about him called El Corrido de Leon, produced by his daughter who also features in the video. Fito is seen in prison because someone of course smuggled recording equipment in. He's wearing a sombrero vuelteado, which is like a traditional Colombian hat made from arrow cane. He's wearing a pinkish red shirt and jeans. Of course, he sports his large trademark beard. He also appears to have a gold watch, a few huge gold rings on each hand, which on closer inspection are in the shape of a lion's head with a mane made of diamonds. And finally, he has a couple of gold chains around his neck. One that has a gold grenade hanging off it. There are some great shots, all in slow motion, of course. He's absorbed in a book, shaking the hands of other prisoners, standing in front of a painted mural of a horse, framed by a golden horseshoe encrusted with precious stones. But my favourite shot is when he's seen stroking a fighting cockerel. Anyway. Let's step out of the twilight zone and back to reality. After the death of Rasquinha, Los Joneros found smaller gangs began splintering away, like Los Tigarones and Los Chone Killers and Los Lobos. Collectively, these groups call themselves Nueva Generación, New Generation. Now, does that name ring a bell? Well, it perhaps should, because it's reported that this gang collective, Nueva Generación, are working with Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación, the Jalisco New Generation Cartel. The worst day of violence inside the prisons came in September 2021. Decapitations, dismembered, burnt and beaten bodies. One family member of a victim who was sent images by an inmate from inside the prison described the pictures as like a butcher shop. 119 people were left dead. Now, this violence inside the prisons did not start after the death of Rasquinha. It had already been a problem for at least a couple of years. The Ecuadorian government at the time declared a state of emergency inside the prisons in May 2019. But it definitely ramped up as the gangs jostled for power. And we have to remember that this criminal violence does spread beyond the epicentre in the prisons. These gangs are involved in not only drug trafficking, but extortion, weapons smuggling, contract killings. But some of the violence we have seen spark memories of the very worst of the violence we've seen in Mexico. Mutilated bodies hanging from bridges, decapitated bodies, kidnappings and car bombs. This latest flare-up of violence led President Naboa to identify 22 organised crime groups in the country and describe them as narco-terrorists. These gangs, alongside the larger transnational organised criminal networks, are fighting over lucrative cocaine trafficking routes to the US and Europe. Just check out these numbers. 699 kilograms found in St. Petersburg, Russia. 9.5 tonnes found in Algeciras, Spain. 139 kilograms found in London, the UK. 2.7 tonnes found in Gioia Taro, in Italy. 11 kilograms found in Mersin Port, Turkey. Over 8 tonnes found in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. I could go on, but this list is just some of the cocaine seizures made in 2023. And the two things that they had in common was that all of these were found within shipments of bananas and all shipments originated in Ecuador. Ecuador has always been a place where cocaine has been shipped mainly to Europe. And there was one internal criminal group that provided all the logistical services that foreign national organized crime groups needed to actually keep the cocaine to Europe. 6,500 containers of bananas leave Ecuador's ports every week. That's why they are so popular with drug smugglers. Police estimate that 70% of drugs smuggled out of the country 
are in banana shipments. Ecuador's role as a major transit country for the international distribution of cocaine is not new, but it's partly down to stability and the success of the country, but it's also an accident of geography. So we need to understand where is Ecuador located, and Ecuador is located literally between the two main cocaine producers of the world, Colombia in the north and Peru on the south. But also Ecuador has really good infrastructure, and this is very important because this differs with the road infrastructure that is present in Colombia or the port infrastructure that is present in Peru. Ecuador has a very developed infrastructure towards the port. And this is why Guayaquil becomes very important because Guayaquil is the main port in Ecuador and one of the main ports in South America with a connection to the Pacific, a lot of rivers, a lot of possibilities to cheap cocaine. According to the Global Organized Crime Index, over the last two years, Ecuador's cocaine market has increased significantly from 7 out of 10 to 8.5 out of 10. In 2023, according to Ecuadorian police data, 197 tonnes of cocaine were seized, which is less than the previous year, which saw over 200 tonnes. Again, the Global Organised Crime Index describes Ecuador as a cocaine superhighway. Much of that passes through the port of Guayaquil, which is, according to the US Department of State, the major transshipment hub for cocaine heading to Europe and the rest of the world. Plus, those years of stability and peace mean that the state has not developed the same protection mechanisms and law enforcement structures as its neighbouring countries. For example, Colombia has battled organised crime for the best part of half a century and has the state security forces in place to be effective. And speaking of Colombia, when the FARC signed the peace agreement in 2016, a huge player in the cocaine production distribution was removed. But there were some who refused to demobilize. The main dissident that Colombia first known was Huacho. Huacho was actually Ecuadorian and he was just from the other side of the border in a municipality named Tumaco in Colombia or in a promise named Esmeralda. And he simply started moving cocaine down the border, which is an uncontrolled border, to storage but also to use Ecuador as a place of delivery to different buyers. And it's not just FARC dissidents that have used Ecuador for their criminal purposes. Remember, Ecuador has become an incredibly important node in the global cocaine distribution system, so it's hardly surprising that other large transnational organized criminal networks operate here too. With the information we have so far, we know about at least three foreign actors operating in the country. The first one and the most historical one has been the Western Balkan or basically the Albanian mafias that has been present in the country at least for 20 years. But they have been operating very under the radar not promoting violence, paying up front to avoid confrontations with local criminal organizations and kind of having a very profitable business of shipment of cocaine through Europe uh, using ports. So their operation of Western Balkans was based on corruption, not only on the state, but also on private sectors and was using ports and boats as the way to move cocaine. The second actor could be the FARC dissident groups, so dissidences that resulted as after the peace agreement. And the third actors are Mexican cartels. Now, we can't go into all of these foreign criminal actors, so let's just focus in on the Mexican cartels in particular. For some time, there's been talk about their push into Colombia. According to Colombia's Ombudsman office, between 2018 and 2022, they issued 20 separate alerts the affiliates of Mexican cartels, in particular the Sinaloa and Jalisco New Generation cartel, were operating on Colombian soil. It's said that they are forging alliances with the ELN, Clan del Golfo and FARC dissidents, which is a terrifying thought. In Ecuador, as we've seen, those same two Mexican cartels have aligned themselves with rival local gangs who provide security for that superhighway of cocaine. The cartels offer money, weapons, drugs and personnel, allowing the gangs to grow and fight each other. Mexican cartels arriving, trying to get a part of this business and trying to get contacts with local criminal networks to operate from them. And apparently they were just landing airplanes, leaving weapons and getting cocaine on it. And this availability of weapons get into the local criminal organizations. And finally, there are now reports that the Primero Commando de Capital, or PCC, and their bitter rivals, Commando Vermeo, the Red Command, 
two powerful criminal groups out of Brazil, are now present in some capacity inside Ecuador. And just for the record, those two criminal groups also have working relationships with both the Sinaloa and Jalisco New Generation cartel. Another moment last year that made international headlines was the shocking assassination of Fernando Villavicencio, a former investigative journalist and then presidential candidate. The attempt to play to the campaign rally of presidential candidate Fernando Villavicencio, who was murdered by higher assassins. He was killed whilst leaving a campaign rally in Quito. And although Villavicencio was not one of the favourites to win the presidency, he had campaigned against corruption in politics and its relationship to organised crime. He once said that you don't negotiate with the Mafia, you fight the Mafia. Before his murder, he'd received death threats. The investigation into his murder revealed that the call to the hitmen came from Cotopaxi, a prison, and was orchestrated by a group called Lobos a la Sombra, the Shadow Wolves, thought to be linked to Los Lobos, although it is known that Fito also issued threats to Villavicencio. The GI's Assassination Witness Project has just released a detailed profile of Villavicencio called The Price Paid for Exposing Narco Politics in Ecuador. I'll put a link to that in the podcast notes. After Villavicencio's murder, six Colombian men were arrested for the act and detained in Litoral Penitentiary in Guayaquil, where shortly afterwards, all six were murdered. They'd been hanged. Finding the mastermind behind these attacks was made significantly more difficult because of these deaths. And Villavicencio was not the only prominent politician killed last year. Agustin Intriago, the mayor of Manta, was shot dead in July. Omar Menendez, a mayoral candidate in Puerto Lopez, was shot in February, the evening before the election. Another mayoral candidate, this time in Salinas, Julio Cesar Faraccio, was shot dead by gunmen on a motorcycle. 2023 was Ecuador's most violent year on record, with a murder rate of 46.5 per 100,000. For context, in 2018, that was just 5 per 100,000. And this violence is causing people to flee, and they're fleeing north. So there is a route that goes from south in the continent and also from the Venezuela and all of them convening Colombia on the Darien Gap. And there is a lot of people, it's like hundreds and thousands of people trying to get to Central America and then to keep their way up to the United States. And the answer is yes, the excess in violence, the extortion mechanisms that are being taken in place are mobilizing Ecuadorians up in this way of the Darien Gap. So actually, if you go and check what the nationality is of the people who is crossing the Darien Gap before it was uh, people from Haiti and even from Africa. Later, it was Venezuelans. But in the last years, Ecuadorians has come to one of the main nationalities trying to go all the way up to the United States. And I believe this is vulnerable people who is living and suffering this violence and to a certain extent has two options to stay there and pay extortion and try to not be recruited by one of these organized groups or actually live in the country and trying to get a better future in, in the United States or in Canada. Some of Villavicencio's investigations often revealed corruption within the state. If we delve back into the Global Organised Crime Index, we see that corruption is rampant in Ecuador. Every significant criminal market, from cocaine to gold and from weapons to human trafficking, state actors are heavily involved. And the level of corruption was made clearer when the Attorney General, Diana Salazar, launched an investigation into the links between the criminal gangs, the police, the judiciary and politicians. It's called Caso Metastases. I would like to start saying that the name of the operation explains a little bit what is going on. Organized crime has got like a cancer that is being metatized among the state and among different layers. And I think that in the last government, this became evident to the point that the president called to new elections and the current government is a government that will be only in place for 18 months before they have to call to elections again. So it's kind of a transition government as a result of, of all of this crisis. So all the candidates that compete for the current position had to have organized crime in their agenda and a response to the organized crime crisis in Ecuador in the agenda. Daniel Novoa started with a more 
preventive approach, but with the pass of time during the campaign and after the assassination of Fernando Villavicencio, he started making much more serious and hardline type of declarations against organized crime. Caso Metastases captured 29 people, including current and former judges and police officers alleged to be involved with organized crime. The investigation stemmed from the arrest of a man called Leandro Norero, known as El Patron, once a trusted associate of Rasquinha, the former leader of Los Choneros. Norero was the founder of one of those breakaway gangs called Los Chone Killers. Norero was well connected and reportedly ran a money laundering and drug financing service for Los Lobos and other criminal groups. Anyway, in amongst the millions of dollars and gold bars, there were 16 cell phones, and they revealed a copious amount of evidence of corruption, from cash and women being offered to police officers to using laundered money to bribe judges. It also shows that Norero was watching Villavicencio. El Patron himself, Leandro Norero, was killed in Cotopaxi jail during a prison riot alongside 14 others. Some media outlets reported that there were beheadings, including possibly Norero. It took a force of 600 police and military entering the prison to regain control. Since that point, there has been a change of administration after allegations of corruption, which included alleged connections to the Albanian mafia, who have been operating in the country for some time. So it's against that backdrop, gang violence in prisons, corruption in the state, an increase of weapons, the Caso metastases, a growing list of foreign criminal actors and an ill-prepared state that President Lasso, who was facing his own impeachment inquiry at the time, dissolved the National Assembly and decided not to run in the upcoming elections. Elections that fatefully brought Villavicencio into the presidential race. And that eventually ended with the second youngest president in Ecuadorian history, 35-year-old Daniel Noboa, who promised to fight organized crime. There is no a clear direction that the government is taking besides declaring the state of emergency, besides saying openly and publicly that he's going to fight this threat. But it's not clear how, with which mechanisms, and more than that, what are the key elements of a comprehensive strategy against organized crime. And I don't think we will see that because the government needs short-term results as they want to propose themselves for election. So we have not seen a comprehensive response to the, to the crisis, but much more reactive measures that will allow first to control the situation, of course, and try to save life, but also to position the president for re-election in the next term. So there is a combination of the needs for security, but also the political needs of the present government. But right now, I could not say what is the response besides what has been public, which is the declaration of an state of emergency and the declaration of an internal armed conflict. And that brings us back to those events on the 9th of January in Guayaquil, when a group of gang members thought to comprise members from Los Lobos attacked the TV studio. Because two days earlier, it was revealed that Fito, the leader of Los Choneros, had vanished from La Regional Prison in Guayaquil and taken all of his weapons, jewellery, laptops, cell phones and so on with him. Apparently, he was due to be transferred to a different prison, but somebody tipped him off. It was this escape that prompted President Daniel Noboa to declare a state of emergency and an enforced curfew for 60 days. In which the condemned for narcotrafico, sicariato and crime organized le dictaban al gobierno de turno qué hacer. Lo que estamos viendo en las cárceles del país es el resultado de la decisión de enfrentarlos. This action resulted in the explosion of chaos on the 9th of January. Several police officers were kidnapped, the attack on the TV station, vehicles set on fire, prison guards held hostage by prisoners, schools, offices, government buildings were closed, shops were looted, and a number of IEDs were detonated around the country. That's when Naboa declared the military were going in to neutralize the narco-terrorists, as he said. This is the second time Fito has escaped. It happened back in 2013. He was eventually caught a few months later back in Manta, but with his latest disappearing trick, Fito's whereabouts are currently unknown. And to compound the issue, Fabrizio Colón Pico, a leader of Los Lobos, also escaped from a different prison. Then just days after the incident at the TV studio, the prosecutor investigating it, Cesar Suarez, was shot multiple times and killed in Guayaquil. 
a few hours earlier he'd spoken about his concerns over his lack of police protection to news outlet El Universo. So, it seems like a strange question to ask, given the sheer number of moving parts. But what happens next? It is impossible to read the future, but what we are seeing right now is that the organized crime groups present in Ecuador literally declared the war to the state. This is a war declaration, and the state is responding, saying who the state is. With the capacities they have, they're saying we're here and we're not going to tolerate this and we're going to respond to this. And this declaration of as a state of emergency is literally putting the military forces on the street to fight organized crime. And right now, local criminal organizations are replicating to their neighborhoods and trying to keep a low profile while they're fighting and they're hitting the government with more specific and more type of terrorist attack. I think that the violence will be sustained in the country, and I don't see that the declaration of a state of emergency will necessarily have an impact on violence, at least in the short term. What could be done is probably the, yeah, the most important question and the most important question for the Ecuadorian government. And I believe that is moving from a reactive approach to a more proactive approach, and that includes to literally design a long-term strategy against organized crime that include fighting corruption in the state, that include strengthening the capacities of law enforcement, but not necessarily for military confrontation to keep violence low, but more to actually disrupt the criminal markets and the criminal ecosystem. And finally, Ecuador is moving towards implementing a prevention approach. And I think this is going to be key, especially for violence. And it's to start considering prevention strategies, prevention mechanisms as a right citizen security policy that can be implemented at the local levels in cities like Guayaquil, like Durán, even like Quito, to avoid violence, to keep escalating, or if it's possible, to start diminishing violence. But working directly with youth people, with local leaders, like increasing community resilience, to try to control that while the state is literally trying to disrupt the criminal organization threat that the country is leaving. Not long ago, Ecuador was considered one of the safest countries in Latin America. But no longer. All countries are touched by organized crime to varying degrees. But these events, which have taken place over just a few years, show what can happen if a state is caught asleep at the wheel. Organised crime has not only taken root, it's fast growing into a monster. That's it for this episode of Deep Dive. A special thank you to Felipe for speaking to us. Felipe's written on what's happening in Ecuador and also separately about the assassination of Fernando Villavicencio. I'll put a link to both of those in the podcast notes as well as any research links. For more information about organised crime from around the world, head over to our website, globalinitiative.net. This has been Deep Dive from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. I'm Jack Megan Vickers. Thanks for listening.